Amen. Let us pray right now. Heavenly Father, as we enter into these uncharted waters, Open the spiritual eyes of discernment of your people. Speak through me to their hearts tonight. And as I speak forth your words of truth and life, may self be crucified. And may Jesus Christ and him only be lifted up and seen. Let the church of God say, Amen. My head, my head. You know, as a people of God, as a church, there are a couple of things that we need to start doing a little more. Now, maybe you are doing it already. I don't know. And if you are, praise the Lord. My wife will tell you that whenever I go, to speak at any church once it's a weekend or a week or two weeks I choose not to stay in the pastor's home nor with any church member and there's a reason for that I want to protect the pastor so that when I deliver God's message nobody will say it's the pastor who told him so or is the brother or sister who, with whom I'm staying who says these things to him. And so I do that. And you can understand that. Am I right? I'm a psychotherapist too. and a counselor. And I understand. Now listen folks. There are some things that I want to empower you to do if you're not doing We are God's people. We are his children. This is God's church. And I'm sure that this is God's church and the sun rising tomorrow morning. But there are some things that need fixing. As we teach and preach, there are three things we do. And one, we are not doing well. We teach and we preach theology. Do you know what is theology? Theology is a doctrine of God. The doctrine of God. We ought to teach and preach theology. We do a good job on theology. We also teach and preach Christology. Christology is the doctrine of Christ. We do a fantastic job in teaching and preaching Christology. But there's a third arm that we're not doing too well with. And that is anthropology and sociology. Anthropology is the doctrine of man. And sociology is man living with and interacting with his fellow men within his environment. Listen to me, Grand Concord. You see, if you don't know how to get along with your husband and your wife, if you don't know how to get along with your brothers and sisters, if you don't know how to get along with your church members, if you don't know how to get along with your co-workers, trust me, you can kiss heaven goodbye. So all I'm saying, as we zero in on this beautiful theme, this thought-provoking theme that you have, that encompasses hopelessness, seeking for divine hope, I want you to understand that life is all about relationship. Life is all about, turn to somebody and say, that's true. Life is all about relationship. And the God whom we serve and the church 
to which we are a part is built on a foundation of relationship and those two foundations or rather pillars are the Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes and they're all about relationship built on a foundation of love. Won't somebody say amen? amen. And so it all started Take a mental flight with me to the book of Kings, 2 Kings, chapter 4. Elijah was a regular visitor to a rustic little town called Shunem. And he would visit and build a good relationship with this man and his wife. The relationship grew very close. They loved him and his servant Gehazi. So one day as Elisha was entertained and left, the wife went to her husband and she said to him, honey, this man of God is very dear to us and he walks a long way just to get here and to continue his journey to one of the schools of the prophets so since he's always stopping here honey why not let us add on another room to our house and we will furnish it with a bed and, and a table and a little stool so that when this man of God comes again, he will have a place to lay his head. You know, there are some women who just know how to push the button. They just know the right buttons to push. When to ask, how to ask, amen, ladies. And the husband quickly said, that's a good idea. Before long, he called some of his workers and they were able to add another room to their home and, and, and were able to furnish this with a bed and a stool and a, a little table. Now, I'm taking you somewhere and I want you to get this. Elisha, in this story, is a type of Christ. A type of whom? Christ. The mother in this story represents the church. Represents what? The church. Stay with me. The father who is a farmer works in the field. The field represents the world. You have to remember that so that you can understand the essence of the message. Amen? The woman represents the church. Elisha is a type of Christ. And the field represents the world. So this particular day, she vis he visits again. To his surprise, after he ate and was getting ready to go, the woman took him by the hand and said, I know you are tired. You're not leaving now. And she led him to the chamber the room, the beautiful addition to their home. And to his surprise, she said, this is your room. Elisha was very pleased and satisfied, and he got his rest. But he really couldn't rest. And so he called his servant Gehazi and said to Gehazi, Gehazi, nobody has ever been so nice to me. All these years, nobody has ever been so kind to me. Gehazi, I, I want to do something for this woman. What, what do you think I can do for her, Gehazi? You know, she's living out here in the suburbs and, and, and maybe, maybe she would be happy if I go and speak to the king on behalf and she can move into the city every now and again 
And Elisha was moving from one suggestion to the next. And Gehazi stopped him and said, Master, that's not what this woman wants. What does she want, Gehazi? Master, the woman is old. Past the age of menopause. And she has no child. Oh. Oh, says Elisha, go call the Shunammite. And Gehazi rushed and called the Shunammite. And the Shunammite came and stood in the door. And, Ge and Elisha looked at her and said, Woman, according to the time of life, according to the time of life, this time next year you're going to have a child. And her countenance changed because she felt deep within the inner recesses of her heart that this man of God whom she adores now is mocking her. Don't mock me. I admire you. I esteem you. I respect you. You know I'm old. You know how much I would love to embrace my own child. And at my old age, you are mocking me. And Elisha repeated, according to the time of life. More specific, you shall embrace a son. And just as he said it, that woman gave birth to a son. Don't miss this. Can you imagine her desire to have a son all her life? Couldn't have one. Now she gave birth. She decided in her mind that this boy is not going to even go out of her sight to attend any of the schools of the prophet. I am going to homeschool him. I am going to watch him day and night. But as all good fathers, the father would come and he would beg psychophantically. Honey, the boy has grown. He needs experience. Why don't you allow him to come with me one day in the field? He can meet the workers. He can see what is being done in the field. Honey, please, I am begging you, allow him to come. And he continued begging, and he begged, and he begged. And his begging really was making sense. Honey, who's going to take over the farm when I grow old? He needs experience. And so, uh, our loving wife, she gave in. She gave in. She gave in. And allow the boy to leave her side and went to the field. The field represents what? The world. And as he went into the field, moving among the workers, the different people, listening to their different conversation as they planned and do what they had to do in the field, suddenly the boy cried out, My head! My head, the piercing sound meandered its way through the air, reached the ears of the father. He ran across to his son. What's wrong with you, son? Daddy, my head, my head. Watch this. The father didn't say take him to a doctor, rush him off to a psychiatrist. The father said take him to his mother. Take him to his mother. Mother has the answer. If anybody can fix this, mother can. The Bible says the lad was rushed to his mother at home. But he stayed out in the field too long. 
he stayed out in the field too long. The mother looked at him and recognized there's no way she could take him to a doctor or for any external help because he was too far gone. The Bible says she sat on a stool in the yard with the boy in her lap. And the boy died at noon. Noon represents a time when he was young, green, and vibrant. Noon represents a time that he had not yet begun to live. He died at noon. The mother lifted the body and meandered her way in to the room that was recently built for Elijah. And she placed the body on Elijah's bed. She walked out and closed the door, took a deep breath, and decided, I must go see my husband. Don't miss this. She mustered all her strength in her body and she ran nonstop to the field. Her husband saw her knowing that he had sent the boy home. Ask the wife the important question. Is it well? Her response came with confidence. It shall be well. But I want you to know the tense. Her response is in the future tense. It shall be well. How do you mean it shall be well? Honey, it shall be well. I need to go find the man of God. Why do you want to go to the man of God? It's not even Sabbath. I must find the man of God. It shall be well. And this husband knew a long time. Don't argue with. Did you get it? Don't argue. And so he got one of his men and they saddled up the buckboard and she already knew where the man of God was because he, whenever she, he passes through, he tells them where he's going. His destination was Mount Carmel. And so she got on the one horse drawn buggy. Destination Mount Carmel. And on their way, they went. And she said, Lad, can't this thing go any faster? Oh, yes, madam. And they sped up faster. The dust was kicking up. And as they neared Mount Carmel, for some reason, Elisha looked in the distance. He saw the silhouette of a carriage as it drew closer. He recognized that it was the Shunammite woman. He turned to his servant Gehazi and said, Gehazi, look yonder, come at the Shunammite. Go yonder and meet her. Gehazi ran down the hill, met the Shunammite woman, and asked the same question her husband asked. And listen to the transition. Is it well... Is it well? She jumped out of that buggy. And as he asked the question, the third, is it well? Notice she said with assurance, with confidence, it is well. No longer it shall be well, but it is well. Do you know why? Because I have found the man of God. 
I am telling no matter what is going on in your life, when you find Jesus, it's well. No matter what is going on, no matter what the sickness, no matter what cul-de-sac your life is in, when you find Jesus, you can say with assurance, you can say with confidence, it is well. And that's why I can sing the song, it is well with my soul. The story didn't end there. Is it well with thy son? It is well. And then she told Elijah what happened. And this blew my mind. Elijah turned to Gehazi. Now you got to understand this. Gehazi was Elisha's apprentice. Just as how Elisha succeeded Elijah, Elisha is preparing Gehazi to succeed him. He taught him stuff to do. So even though this boy was dead, Elisha knew that he had taught Gehazi enough. So he should be able to do this. Take my wand, Gehazi, and go and do your thing. Gehazi said, are you coming, madam? You can go, Gehazi, because as the Lord liveth, I'm not leaving this man. I am not leaving you, Elisha. I need you to understand. Gehazi went. Nothing happened. And I want you to get the answer. Nothing happened because the woman had no faith in Gehazi. Her faith was wrapped up and tied up in Elisha, the man of God. You can't achieve anything without faith. And the Bible says, Elisha complied, went with the woman. By this time, the body was cold. Elijah went in, prostrated himself on the lad's body, prayed, 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 and nothing happened. So he thought. Because the body began to get warm. But I want you, I got so much out of this, folks. I'm telling you that there are times when you're praying and the prayer is so intense that you could be drained physically. Elijah was drained physically because he was so intense in praying that powerful prayer to raise this lad back to life that he himself got weak. The Bible said he climbed off the lad. And began to pace the room. And by so doing now, he is now being regenerated. And when he climbed back on the lad, and he prayed again, the Bible says, the boy sneezed seven times. He lived. He lived. Praise the Lord. He lived. Give up. You can't give up when God hasn't given up on you. You serve a God who raised the dead. You serve a God who make dumb mouth to speak, blind eyes to see, and deaf ears to hear. There's nothing too hard for him. Give up. How dare you talk about hopeless. God's people can never be hopeless because we have everything to live for and if you don't have everything to live for thank God you do have something to die for hopeless that word should not even be found in our vocabularies we serve a God who saves to the utmost He 
He promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you. He says, I will be with you all way, even to the end of the world. And I believe that. So I'm not afraid of anybody nor anything. And as God's people today, people of prophecy, you should know and understand you should not be surprised by what is happening in the world today, yea, even here in America. You should not be taken by surprise. You know, hopeless. You should be a walking postcard showing I live by hope of a better tomorrow. And so tonight, as we close off, just laying the foundation for tomorrow, as we get deeper into this, and as we close off tomorrow evening, I'm going to ask you to get on the phone tonight. Call your brothers and sisters. Call your friends. I don't care if they attend another church. They don't want to miss tomorrow. And tomorrow night, as we continue to scratch where it's itching. And tomorrow evening, you'll get a chance to even ask questions from the floor. It's your time now. Because the God who created you without you can't save you without you. You play a part in your eternal salvation. Trust and obey, he says. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So if you're here tonight, just visiting. If you're here tonight, going through your struggles, whatever those struggles are. If you're overwhelmed with a problem, whatever that problem is. One thing I know for sure, Jesus is the solution to every problem. And he's the answer to every question. I believe that with all my heart. And when trouble comes my way, because they do come every now and again, I just step back and ask God, so now, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to teach me, Jesus? Because there is no purposeless trial. Every trial serves a purpose. So by the grace of God tomorrow, you'll be here as we seek to find out what is your purpose. God bless you. Amen. Will you stand with me? Great God and Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you for this beautiful Sabbath. Thank you for those who came together and purposefully planned this weekend's program. The message went forth, Lord. Already your people have responded with joy. Take your people home tonight. Help them to ponder these things. And help each one to recognize that they play a part in the finishing of the work. And may they embrace that opportunity tonight and begin to do their part. Thank you for the opportunity to deliver this message to your people. In the name of the Father, 
In the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, let the church say, Amen. Amen.